Well, our first study in the series, Behold I Come, Blessed Are They That Watch. Now, what we want to do as we walk through our studies together during the week is we want to cover predominantly four chapters of the Apocalypse. We want to look at chapters 11 and 16 and chapters 10 and 14. And you'll notice that we have grouped those two into pairs. And there's a reason for that. For us to really come to terms and understand Revelation 16, we need to understand the content and context in Revelation 11. Revelation 11 becomes a a platform or a springboard taking us into the 16th chapter. So seeing the link between those two is going to be very important. And of course, likewise, with chapters 10 and 14, or chapter 10, that's the angel which comes down from heaven, the right foot upon the sea and the left foot upon the earth, all those interesting details. And then chapter 14, the lamb on Mount Zion, the hour of judgment, the mid-heaven proclamation. When we bring these two together, chapter 10 and chapter 14, it just opens up. You're reading 14, you go, I understand that. You're reading chapter 10, I understand that because of those connecting links. So that's where we're going to take our journey in our studies together. It doesn't hurt to do an overview just to determine where we are going to sit with relationship to our studies. And I think many of us in this room would be aware of that structure. We'll be aware that the book of Revelation is divided up into three main sections. We have the seals, we have the trumpets, and we have the vials. The seals, Revelation 6, God would bring judgment on pagan Rome. And then in the trumpets, we then have God bringing judgment on Christian Rome. And then we spill into the vials, and the first five of those vials, the work and career of Napoleon, God would bring judgment on the Holy Roman Empire. Now, what we're going to be doing in our studies together is we're going to, and I'll say this very slowly, which is very tricky for an Australian, we're going to begin our studies this morning in the second half of the sixth trumpet. You see, the sixth trumpet is divided into two parts. So chapter 11 is the second part or second half of the sixth trumpet. So we're going to move in two of our studies, today and tomorrow, we're spending in the second half of the sixth trumpet, which is chapter 11. And then we're going to be moving in through these seven vials. Our third study, the first five vials. Our fourth study, the sixth vial. And our seventh study, our seven, no, we're not doing seven. Our fifth study will be the seventh vial. Now, brothers and sisters, young people, in our studies, by considering the second part of the sixth trumpet and sweeping through to the seventh vial, we're going to be looking at two of the three great earthquakes of the apocalypse. So through chapter 11, we'll be looking at the amazing detail of the French Revolution. And all the verses just explode with with immense power and thrills us with the hand of God. And then, of course, in our last studies together, we're going to be looking at the 40-year period between Armageddon and the beginning of the millennium, the third great earthquake. Now, now, if you've got really good eyes, shame on you for having such good eyes. But if you've got really good eyes, you'll see the word Armageddon is written along that third great earthquake. That's not correct. The third great earthquake is not Armageddon. Armageddon is the last event of the sixth vial. <coughs> the third great earthquake is the seventh vial. So we'll talk more about that a little later on. All right. Now let's just tidy up in our minds with respect to this, well, this sixth trumpet being divided into two parts. What I want to do is spend a couple of minutes with you walking through and seeing in through the trumpets and see how when we get to the sixth trumpet, it is in fact split down the middle by the 10th chapter for a reason. So let's just walk through that for a few brief moments. 
What I'd like to do, brothers and sisters, is just open our Bibles to Revelation 8 and verse 1. Now, while you're doing that, I'm going to go look at my pointer, which I've thrown in here somewhere. We just have a young people's group, so maybe they souvenir it, I suppose. All right, it saves me pushing that button to there. All right, Revelation 8 and verse 1. Just sweep through very, very quickly a few little points about these trumpets leading us into the fact that the sixth trumpet is in fact divided into two parts. So, Revelation 8 and verse 1. And we read these words. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence. Silence in the political heavens of Rome. Here, brothers and sisters, is AD 324. Constantine has taken the West in 312. And 12 years of war and war and war and war in heaven, we now come to the fact that here, as the seventh seal opens, there's silence in Constantine's political economic realm. It's AD 324. And then, brothers and sisters... When we find Constantine in power, God is now going to judge. Having judged the pagan Roman Empire and rolled it away like a scroll, Constantine's now here. Remove paganism. Now God's going to bring judgment on Christian Rome. And what he does, he's going to lop off the three major sections of the Christian Roman world post-Constantine. And so what God is going to do is going to, with the first four trumpets, the wind trumpets, we refer to them as, God is going to lop off the Latin West with the first four trumpets. And bear with me. Just pushing these buttons, nothing's happened. Not even your eyelids are flickering when I push the button. So I'll put that in there and we will push this. Excellent. So God is going to lop off the Latin third with the first four trumpets, the four Germanic barbarians as they sweep down from the Rhine and the Danube. The Latin West, gone. Then through the fifth trumpet, which is the first half of chapter 9, God is going to bring the Saracens as they stream out of Arabia into Palestine, they stream across the north of Africa, they come into Spain and they're stopped, are the Saracens, at Tua by Charlemagne's grandfather. So the Saracens are going to lop off the Hellenized part of the Christian Roman Empire. That's the second third that is gone. Now we come to the second part of chapter 9. So we'll just turn the page and we have a look at Revelation chapter 9 and we read the beginning of the, well, first half of the sixth trumpet. And so here we are in verse 13. Of Revelation 9. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, Loose the four angels, the four messengers, and there would be a wave of Turkomans, four Turkoman tribes that would sweep across from the Euphrates, and they would come and they would lop off in this first part or first half of the sixth trumpet they would lop off the final third of the Christian Roman world, the Hellenic East. Now, the sixth trumpet begins there in verse 13. So you think, okay, we get to the end of chapter 9, that is the end of the sixth trumpet. No. You turn the page to chapter 11 and you pick up the verse in verse 14. This is the end of the sixth trumpet. Beginning in verse 13 of chapter 9, doesn't stop at the end of chapter 9. We then move into chapter 11, we get to verse 14, and we read, the second woe is past. Or, the sixth trumpet is past. Some of us may not be aware of this, but the first four trumpets are the wind trumpets. When you look at the end of chapter 8, God introduces three more trumpets and says, Woe, 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 by the voices of the trumpets that are yet to sound. So really, trumpets five, six, and seven are 
Blow trumpets one, two, and three. Therefore, when you read verse 14, the second woe is past. It is the sixth trumpet is now finished, having begun in chapter 9. Why then does the tenth chapter split the sixth trumpet? You know, brothers and sisters, John is looking at this awful system that's being developed, this Catholic system. And he sees the German barbarians come down and lop off the Latin West. He then sees the Saracens lop off the Hellenic East. He then sees the Turks lop off the the Hellenic East. And then he says, will this system ever, ever repent? Because you read in verse 20 of chapter 9, the rest of them which were not killed by these plagues, yet they repented not that they should worship devils and that they should worship this and that. Verse 21, neither repented they of their murders or of their sorceries or of their fornication or of their thefts. John is looking at judgment, 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 and they won't respond. They won't repent. And John could be very well getting very depressed and very anxious. And if we didn't have chapter 10 and we then spilled straight into chapter 11, oh, they're at it again. They're persecuting and treading down the temple, the altar and the holy city. John and the brothers and sisters that lived in this time, you need to just take a breath and be lifted up. They will not continue forever. Therefore, God gave John a vision of the future when this system would be non-existent. And we pick that verse up in chapter 10 and we read in verse um, we read in verse 5 and 6. John needed this. He could not have spilled from chapter 9 straight into chapter 11. It would have been awful. Very depressing. And therefore, John was lifted up as were the brothers and sisters of that day. And in verse 5 of chapter 10 we read, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea, and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that therein are. John... Brothers and sisters who lived then, there is coming a time when there will be time no longer. They are going to be brought to heal. They will not continue to blaspheme God and mock him forever and ever. And John needed that, brothers and sisters, as do we. When we look out on the world today and all that's going on, all the immorality, all the blasphemy, We need these kind of visions. There is coming a time, brothers and sisters, where there will be time no longer. So John takes the breath and then we spill in to the second half of the sixth trumpet, which is Revelation and chapter 11. So, brothers and sisters, we have a challenge. Not only do we have a clock that is challenging us, but we have a challenge for in two studies we go to walk through chapter 11. No way will we attempt to do a verse by verse. In fact, that's not the right way to go about this chapter. What we're going to do in chapter 11, the challenge that faces us, we've got a chapter filled with graphic symbology, amazing imagery and detail. And we have in chapter 11 a chapter that spans a period of nearly 50, 1,500 years. And we're going to do it in 45-minute sessions. But we will. 1,500 years, a sweep of history through Revelation chapter 11. So let's pick it up now and work through chapter 11. And what we're going to do, brothers and sisters, we're going to actually present to you scaffolds. We're going to present to you structures, links, so you can see big pictures and go, oh, I see where I am. Okay, I see where that fits, where that fits, where that fits. And then we're going to add in some detail to add colour to the drama of this chapter. Now, I'm putting this up here. You're going, oh, I'll never read that in a million years. But technology... Technology and us older people, you younger people, take note of this. Us older people, look at this. I did that once and I didn't know how to get it back again. (laughs) But I do now. All right. So what we've got here, brothers and sisters, in Revelation chapter 11, inexorably, as we have in Revelation 16, we're leading to the climax of the second great 
earthquake, the French Revolution. Notwithstanding, the last five verses of chapter 11 are a summary of the seventh trumpet. So notwithstanding that, we'll about that later, this chapter is leading us through all these years to the climax of the French Revolution. Now, what we have in chapter 11 is we have three major players in this drama. Now, let's have a look at these three major players. And the first one of the brothers and sisters we find in the first two verses. And with these, they are given a title, the first major player in this drama. And the three titles given to this first major player are the temple, the altar, and the holy city. These are the brothers and sisters in Christ. They are the saints, and they're called the temple, the altar, and the holy city. And we read there in verse 1 that they are measured. And the rod that's used to measure them is the Greek rhabdos. They're going to suffer awful persecution, but they're going to suffer, they're going to suffer and have to sacrifice their lives for the things that they stand for. And they're going to be measured, our brothers and sisters, over a period, the record says, of 42 months. Now, that's one of the time periods in the apocalypse. And I think in this audience, many of us would be aware that 42 months, you've got it in your margins, I'm sure, many of you, most of you, but not all of you. This is 1,260 years. 30 days in a month, 30 multiplied by 42, 1,260 days on a day filling your principle, 1,260 years. Our brothers and sisters are going to be trodden down by the monster of Catholicism. <laughs> All right. The second major player in this drama are given four titles. And the second major player are called, in verse 3, my two witnesses. The second major player are called the two olive trees. They are called, in verse 4, the two lampstands. And then, as we sweep across to verse 10, these two prophets. So this second major play in this drama have got four titles. Now, brothers and sisters, I'll say this very, very carefully, slowly. They are not the brothers and sisters. Oh, you read through Eureka and you go, I, I know, I, I love Eureka to bits. Absolutely love it to bits. But Brother Thomas, he, 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 he. Elvis Israel section three is, to me, much more clear in Brother Thomas's exposition. But I'll say this. These two witnesses, these two olive trees, these two lampstands, these two prophets are not the brothers and sisters. The brothers and sisters are the temple, the altar, and the holy city. These witnesses are two anti-papal witnesses. They stand against the papacy. They are religious and they are secular. Two of them. And they form, if you like, a buffer to protect and to preserve, unwittingly so, the true brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's the second major player in this drama of chapter 11. Now I'm going to zoom back. And the third major player we have given for us is, is, oh no, we'll come back to them. Right. These two witnesses, these two olive trees, these two lampstands, these two prophets, not being brothers and sisters, we do get an, a strong indicator in the chapter in chapter 11 that they cannot be brothers and sisters because, brethren and sisters, these two witnesses fight. And our brothers and sisters, we do not fight. Not yet. Not until we are commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do they fight, but they take peace away in verse 6. These two witnesses have power to shut up heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now, if you were to go and have a look at this psalm, Psalm 72 and verse 6 through 7, you can see that he shall come down like rain upon mown grass as the showers that water the earth. And in his day shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace. And so we've got rain and peace 
used in conjunction with one another. So when it says in Revelation, they shall have the power that it rain not, they are taking peace away from the earth. And what we read also about these two witnesses is we see in that verse there, verse 7, that they're killed. So we read in verse 7, and when they have finished their testimony, these anti-papal religious and secular witnesses, when they've finished their testimony, the beast, the Catholic system that is sent out of the abyss will make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. And then we read that these witnesses, where they fall down dead and are killed, they come back to life again in verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God, God's in control, entered into these witnesses wherever they fell down. They come back to life again and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So they are not the brothers and sisters. They are, call them the Protestants, if you will, and secular people who were anti-papal. Now, the third major player in this drama are given three titles. They are... The God of the earth in verse 4, the Roman Catholic system. In fact, you might have in your margin 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He that sits in the temple of God claiming that he is God on earth. This is the papal system. And so these two witnesses, anti, they're standing against, against the papal system. They are anti-papal. So that's one title given to the third major player in this drama and the other title is given in verse 10. They that dwell upon the earth, they that dwell upon the earth, twice used. And verse 7, the third title of this major, third major player is the beast. The Roman Catholic system, the God of the earth, the beast, and they that dwell upon the earth. So they are, brothers and sisters, the three major players in this drama of chapter 11. Now, when you come back to there, there's a little question that needs to be asked. And I'm going to lift this up, expand this for you. I hope your eyeballs are okay with this going in and out. Now, here's a question. These two witnesses speak out in verse 3. I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they're going to prophesy, they're going to speak out for 1,200 and 60 days. Question. The temple, the altar, and the holy city, the brothers and sisters, are going to be trodden down for 42 months. 1,260 years. The witnesses are going to speak out for 1,260 days. 1,260 years. Same time period. Why does God write them differently? Why are 42 months attributed to the saints, 1,260 years, and 1,260 days attributed to the witnesses themselves? Why not have both 42 months or both 1,260 days? Why? There are two reasons. And the first reason, brothers and sisters, is that God wants us to clearly understand <coughs> that there is a difference between these two groups. The saints are contrasted to the anti-papal witnesses. 42 months attributed to the saints and 1,260 days attributed to the witnesses. Exactly the same time period. Why write them differently? Two reasons. There's your first. God says they're different. The second reason why they are written differently is because each of them have a different starting point and a different finishing point. Now, when you come to the saints who are going to be persecuted and trodden down by the Catholic system for 1,260 years, that expression 42 months <coughs> is picked up. Now, we're not going to go there. We're not going to go into Revelation 13. We want to focus on the witnesses because they form the major part of Revelation 11. And time, of course, is the enemy. 
<laughs> we're not going to go there, but if you were to go to Revelation 13, you would see that same expression. That should key. When did the witnesses, sorry, when did the saints begin to be persecuted? We don't know when it started unless we go to Revelation 13. And when you go to Revelation 13, you will see the same expression, 42 months. You'll see in Revelation 13 where a dragon, the emperor in Constantinople, gives power to the beast, the bishop in Rome. That's Revelation 13. And that power, that imperial acknowledgement that the bishop in Rome was the great bishop. I mean, the bishop in Rome will say, oh, I'm greater than the bishop in Constantinople. I'm greater than the bishop in, 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 uh, in Antioch. I'm greater than the bishop, the Catholic bishop in, in Alexandria. I'm the greatest. But it had never been imperially ratified. There's the bishop in Rome puffing his chest out and saying, I don't care about all these other Catholic bishops. I am the greatest. But it was never imperially ratified until Justinian and Phocus. Empress in Constantinople, the dragon. And those two dragons, Christian dragons, gave imperially ratifying power to the bishop in Rome to make him the head bishop. Justinian, focused, 75 years apart. And therefore, the starting point, Justinian starts the ball rolling, focus finishes. And the starting point of that is, as we have on the screen, 608. 610 through 1260 years through to 1868, 1870, when the papacy lost their temporal power. A temporal power that was given to them way, way, way back then through Justinian and Focus. That's all I want to say about that. So the witnesses in, sorry, the temple, the altar, and the holy city in Revelation 11 began to be trodden down in 610 and would cease to be trodden down by this terrible power of the papacy. 1,260 years later. Enough said of that. Sorry about quickly running through that. Let's now focus on these two witnesses who are killed after having speak, spoken out and who are coming back to life in chapter 11. These two witnesses, these two olive trees, these two lampstands, when did they begin their witness? As they are witnessing in chapter 11. When did they begin and when did they finish? Well, brothers and sisters, the key, like we use the key in Revelation 13 and couple that with the 42 months, the key is Revelation 12. We've got the same expression in Revelation 12, 1,260 days. Now, if we just put our foot into chapter 12, we're just going to unlock just a little bit and see when the witnesses began to witness and see when they finish their witnessing. All right, so we're coming to Revelation chapter 12. And what we have here in Revelation chapter 12 is we have a woman running away. So we have there in verse, um, in verse 6, let me put my glasses on. Okay, we have in verse 6, and the woman, whoever she is, whoever she is for now, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed this woman there. Now, here's our key from Revelation 11, 1,260 days. Now, brothers and sisters, this woman is running away from someone who does not like her. And this woman who is running away, whoever she is, is being placed into a wilderness state. <laughs> She's been put into a wilderness state by someone else. And then you read about this woman running away from someone who's placing her into a wilderness state. You read about this woman running away, whoever she is, and to this woman were given two wings of the great eagle. The great eagle, the Roman Empire. So this woman is placed into an exiled state in the extremities of the Roman world. Who is this woman? Who is she running away from? Who is she being placed into a wilderness state by? Well, brothers and sisters, she's running away from another woman. And that woman that we are very familiar with in Revelation 12 and verses 1 through 2, she is the truth gone bad. She's expecting a child. She's corrupted. She is, ultimately, having been adorned with the sun, political power, 
having had the victory over paganism, the 12 stars. She's now the state religion, the moon under her feet. She is the Catholic church that her son, the man-child, set up. Therefore, when you read about this Catholic woman who is causing this other woman to be put into an exiled state, when you read about this woman, you read, therefore, in verse 5, and she, this corrupt system, brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Of course, that man-child, as we know, is Constantine. So this woman is going to give birth to a man-child. When was Constantine born? Constantine, as the man-child, was politically born in 312. So as Constantine streamed down from York in England, and he moved down to make war against the pagan emperor in Rome, Maxentius, and he fought the battle at Milvian Bridge. Constantine streams down, he beats Maxentius, he comes into Rome, it's 312, and the Senate say to Constantine, you are now the chief emperor. He's born in 312. He's the man child, born in 312. But like all newborn babies, it takes a while to work out who your mother is. I mean, you ask any one-week-old baby, who's your mother? I don't think they'd know. Not quite yet. So he was Constantine, 312, he's born. But he doesn't know who his mum is. And so these different religious sects are all vying for supremacy. And they're coming to Constantine, the now chief emperor. They're coming, oh, pick me, favour us, favour me, favour me. And there's a couple of years roll by three, in fact, after three years, Constantine went, of all these different sects, you, you, the Catholic Party, you, I'm going to clothe with political authority. I'm going to make you now the universal religion. So then, three years after he was born, he really identified his mum and lifted her up. But this woman here, religious community said, what have we to do with politics? What have we to do with the courts of Constantine? No, this is not what we should be doing. To wit, Constantine said, shape up or ship out. If you do not follow this new established Catholic system, you will be placed into an exile state. And so, brothers and sisters, there were a group in North Africa who became the first Christian movement to oppose the union of church and state. And they were the Donatus or Donatus of North Africa. They were the first religious anti-papal witness. So these witnesses began in Constantine's birth in 312. They began to witness. But we have in Revelation 11 a religious and a secular witness is the secular witness revealed for us in Revelation and chapter 12. Oh, yeah. So in Revelation and chapter 12, how's that down that back there? Do I need to do my special little technological push button with my finger? Or can you read that? All good? Fantastic. So we have a religious witness in chapter 12, and we have a secular witness in chapter 12, which then transferred into that 11th chapter where our two witnesses. So what we've got there, brothers and sisters, in verse 16, we've got the earth helping this Protestant protesting woman who had nothing to do with Constantine and his new elected church who are saying we are being exiled by the Catholics. We have the earth in verse 16. We will read, and the earth helped this religious woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up this persecutional flood that was coming from Constantine in the first instance. So there, brothers and sisters, in verse 15, the serpent, Constantine in the first instance, Constantine's sons thereafter, and the emperors who then resided in Constantinople, the serpent. The Christian serpent and the Christian dragon sent out a great flood of judgment to carry away these protesters against the Catholic system. And we know that in Scripture, a flood in Isaiah 8 and verse 7 and Jeremiah 46 and verses 7 through 8 is a symbol of judgment. So Constantine is going to judge this, this protesting woman. 
But God's not going to allow this woman to disappear. God's going to raise up a group, a bunch of people in North Africa called the Circumcellians. They were kind of religious, but over-the-top religious. They were going around, they, they read somewhere in the Bible that he that lives by the sword shall die by the sword. So these circumcillians used to carry not swords, but they used to carry clubs. So they thought, that's not in the scriptures, so I can beat people to death with clubs. And they called these clubs Israelites. So they've got a kind of like a mixture of religion that very secular, very anti papal And they were so crazy in their intensity, they would go out there and they'd be killing people, hoping that they would be put to death themselves. To which the Donatists or Donatists kind of like, mm, I'm not really going down your way, but it's lovely that you're able to kill a few Catholics to make sure that we don't become extinct. So you've got the earth and you've got the woman. You've got the secular witness and you've got the Christian witness, all beginning in 312. So if we've got in Revelation 12 the religious witness, the secular witness, in Revelation 11, we've got the altar, the temple, and the holy city, as well as the two witnesses. In Revelation 12, is the temple, the altar, and the holy city there, along with the secular and religious witness? Yes, it is. Because what we've got there, brothers and sisters, is the remnant of her seed. We've got a Catholic woman, a protesting woman, and a remnant of the woman's seed, the true brothers and sisters. So in Revelation 12, three women. Catholics, Protestants, if you will, and the brothers and sisters in Christ, mixed up with the heretic Protestants in the Catholics' eyes. So there we are. So we have the remnant of the seed. And we won't look that up, but if you want to take notes, the first time in the Apocalypse that, that expression, the remnant of the seed, is used is in Revelation 2, 24. And look at verse 20. It's in the context of that woman, Jezebel. Read that in your own legend. It's astounding. Do that cross-reference and you go, oh, well, look at that. So the remnants of her seed first used in the context of Thyatira and that woman, woman, Revelation 12, that woman, Jezebel. And there was a remnant amongst that group. All right, brothers and sisters, now we just almost going very well. Eight minutes to go. I'm loving this clock. Great for those who've got bad eyes. Can you see that clock there, brother? Okay, that's fantastic. Now, brothers and sisters, just to pull all this together and just to show you as we then launch in tomorrow for our next study, have a look at this timeline with respect to these two witnesses of Revelation and chapter 11. Already established, and we've said that in 312, based on Revelation 12, we have the woman and the earth, the Donatists in the first instance, and the Circumcellions. And then they would then continue into other names who would be anti-papal through history. So if you don't have a little cross-reference in Revelation 11 verse 3, cross-referencing to Revelation 12 verse 6 and verses 14 through 17, great idea to jot those little quotes seeing when the witnesses first began to speak out. And as we saw, the witnesses would witness for 1,260 years. Now that brings us, if Revelation 12 tells us they began when Constantine was born, 312, that takes us, brothers and sisters, to 1572. Because in Revelation 11, we read that the witnesses are killed, 1572. And many of us in this room would know the historic hallmark of 1572, where that would be the massacre of the Huguenots on St. Bartholomew's Day. And there we have depicted there Catherine de' Medici. Now, she's a woman that's painted as the Black Queen. Her son was the king of France. She's painted as the Black Queen. But, you know, when you read about this woman, Catherine de' Medici, she wanted the Protestants and she wanted the Catholics to, to come together. There had been years and years and years of controversy between these two religious groups. She wanted to try and bring them together. She wasn't all black, but pretty black, but not all black. So here she is supervising in this painting the slaying in France of the Huguenots. Now I want you to just note this. When we have a look at verse 
7 of Revelation 11. I just want you to note this, brothers and sisters, and not, not stumble over these couple of verses here. So we've got there that 1260 years later, the witnesses, and mind you, the Huguenots, Calvinists, the Huguenots were, were, they were, they were divided into three groups, into two groups. If you were a Calvinist, they called you a Huguenot of religion. If you were anti the king or the authority, they called you Huguenots of the state. So these Huguenots that were slain were incredibly religious and incredibly political. And they became the stand of Providence, Provin Protestants throughout Europe. So the Huguenots being slain. Now I want you to come here to Revelation 11 and read verse 7 and then verse 8. And not trip over this if you haven't got this written in your margin. Catherine de Medici, supervising the slain of 3,000 in one day followed by a further 68,000 Huguenots in the months that ensued. 71,000 of them slain. But verse 7, we read this, Revelation 11. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the witnesses, the beast, the Catholic system that ascendeth out of the abyss, shall make war against them and kill them, overcome them and kill them. 1572. Now you'll note there on the screen, that I've got there, the slaying of the witnesses begin. They begin. So the intensity of, this, of these atrocities begin in 1572. But when you read verse 8, this is not 1572, verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse 8, 1685. There's 113 years between verse 7 and verse 8. So in verse 7, in 1572, an awful massacre, 71,000. And they would continue to be slain and slain and slain. Some of them would come back a little bit, then they'd be slain, they'd come back again, they'd be slain. There'd be these ups and downs, ups and downs for 113 years until in verse 8, 1685, the Huguenots were totally, completely, politically and religiously gagged. Gone. And then their dead bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. So be aware of that, brothers and sisters. Verse 7, 1572. Verse 8, 1685. And I'm going to expand on that, God willing, in our studies tomorrow morning. The heading being, and they stood upon their feet, and the same hour there was a great earthquake.